Hello together and welcome back. Here's Daniel speaking. And I will welcome you to our really last exercise, so far at least, um, where we want to take a look at um, two state-of-the-art policy gradient algorithms called deep, deep, deep deterministic policy gradients and proximal policy optimization. The first part of the video is guided by me and for the PPO I will hand over to my colleague Wilhelm Kirchgästner later on. Okay, um, we will first develop um, on each the algorithms on our own and later on we will take a look at a today common RL library here we've taken stable baselines. As application we will use the Goddard's rocket problem which is provided as environment in an additional file here in the folder and we've taken that from the linked git. Yeah, in the example like shown as well in the picture below here we try to vertically scan a rocket in order to reach the maximum possible altitude. In our model, we consider then the mass is that the mass is decreasing while we spend fuel, and the drag and the gravity are changing over the height of the rocket here. The states of our environment are the rocket's vertical position, um, the velocity, and the mass which are normalized in our n here for u within the range of 0 and 1. And the goal is here to find an optimal thrust profile. Our action space is continuous in the range from 0 to 1, where 1 means we use the maximum thrust and the values between 0 and 1 that the engine is throttled. And therefore mm, the goal is then to interact with an agent in the as well continuous state space. During the episode um, the reward in general is set to 0 which we get from the environment and if an episode is terminating, the maximum height reached by the rocket during the experiment here is the used reward, which we get then back. And um, if the rocket has not depleted its tank at all after 300 steps, um, we give back a penalty of minus 1 and the episode terminates to avoid that the agent simply does nothing and the environment will not terminate at all. If you want to execute later on our um, demo as well, please make sure that you've installed stable baselines if you want to execute that. And now let's have a look at our first uh, off-policy DDPG algorithm. Yeah, so uh, let's start with a brief introduction. Um, for estimating the best actions for a specific state in a continuous state space, that is comp computational challenging like we've uh, learned because we would have to iterate over all possible actions. Yeah, therefore, um, the DDPG uses um, uh, instead an actor-critic approach we have got to know in our last exercise. And the critic is estimating the values of the actions for a specific state and is trained to minimize the mean squared Bellman error using the loss function defined over here. And um, the actor defines our policy and is trained to maximize the Q function like we should have learned in lecture. Therefore, we use their gradient ascent. Mm. 
to not use the same q value function to estimate the target here in the loss function for the critic while training the same parameters used for estimating that target DDGP, uh, ddpg um, uses target networks to estimate that target which are in the beginning simple copies of the actor and critic and um, yeah they are updated during the learning in a low the low pass filter manner in general ddpg is an off policy algorithm so the, um, the training data is fetched from a replay buffer and since the policy is deterministic we add in our case a normal uh, gaussian noise uh, to draw actions during uh, to the drawn actions during the training to trigger exploration for the implementation we will show in this exercise a different tool from tensorflow um, we have used so far here we introduce now PyTorch because Stable Baseline 3 is also based on PyTorch. And because it's maybe new for you, um, we have provided in the templates a uh, few more cells to get familiar with the syntax, which should be quite straightforward if you have already used TensorFlow last time. Um, we will, like always, discuss only important parts of the code. And um, if you want to have a PyTorch introduction, we would refer to the PyTorch websites where you can find helpful tutorials. For more details about the algorithm itself, we refer, of course, to our lecture and uh, maybe to spinning up where also a good introduction can be found. And also we've used um, their code as yeah, orientation for hours like for example um, the already provided multi-layer perceptron here there are some helper functions and like promised we provided to you also the implementation of the actor and critic with PyTorch and um, the replay buffer so here in the agent um, you first add to define the actor and critic and the dimensions of the replay buffer and um, yeah, here we use that deep copy method to copy the target networks uh, from there and as you see we again uh, use the atom optimizer you should know from the last exercise also you should be familiar with the deliberate function for the training process where we do gradient descent um, in here for the critic and gradient ascent on the actor as shown here by calculating the losses using the predefined loss functions here so Let's um, briefly look a little bit deeper into the critic loss function um, over here. Here you see um, now that we first calculated the Q value using the critic, feeding it with the state and the actions. And next we will calculate here the targets um, using the target networks for the actor and the critic. And as you see here, um, this is done in the torch no grad, yeah, let's say area, meaning we only want to calculate the output using the networks, but do not want to update them on the backward path later on. Um, this is also mentioned somewhere above in the definition that you could deal with it. Um, yeah, this is somewhat slipped, uh, flipped from, uh, to the TensorFlow gradient tape you already know. And 
Yeah, additionally, in the uh, target calculation, we use a little trick here that Python interprets Boolean equals true as one and false as zero. So in case of we are done here, um, we only use the reward here in the end from that step. Yeah, the actor loss function itself um, is quite straightforward here and just the implementation of the formula above it should be mentioned that um, we give back here that minus sign uh, to do gradient ascent because the optimizer by default does gradient descent. Um, I think that we also know from one of the last exercises. So back to our deliberate function here. Um, using the data we fetch from the buffer, um, <coughs> we update the networks using that loss function here. Next, we call the backward method and do an optimizer step here to update the critic and the same goes for the actor here. In the end, uh, the target networks are updated again in that no, uh, using that torch no grad, um, because we will update them like described in the algorithm 13.1 from the lecture we should implement here a little into the direction of actor and critic. If we have a look here into the decide function, we will see that um, the actor act function is called and um, not simply the actor function depending on the state. Um, if we have a look at our actor again, we will see that in that case um, we use again the torch no grad to just give back an action and um, without any gradient information we would get if we simply call actor of state where we get into the forward method over here. Um, yeah, and in the end if um, we do not a deterministic test run, for example, we add some um, Gaussian noise scaled here to our action for exploration. And this could be also um, exchanged, for example, by the einstein ullenberg noise we already know. Okay, let's start training. Um, in the next cell, we provided here we trained four different agents two times. First um, we update after each episode using as many update steps as we have run in that episode. In the next four we update every step once. Um, you find both variants in literature and libraries. Um, the episode wise could be emphasized by the sparse reward signal we got here from the environment. Because we get a reward not equal to zero, not until the end of the episode. It could make sense to update not before the episode has ended. To ensure that we have at least one or two rewards uh, not equal to zero in the buffer. We start the learning process um, after here 500 steps. Mm. And yeah, because an episode has somewhat an average about 200 steps roughly. So let's scroll to our results here. Um, yeah, there it can be seen here. Green, the reach reward per training episode, and in blue, the um, episode length itself. In red, we have indicated here an optimal solution, which uh, an analytical optimal solution, which um, yeah will be explained in the second part a little bit detailed and um, should be 
uh, performing as a benchmark here. And in um, yellow and orange, um, we see the average and best revert um, after 10,000 random drawn actions. So it can be seen that the problem is not that hard if um, the rocket is able to fly that high, uh, that it reaches an average reward of, what is it here, 0 0.01, uh, mm, using only random actions. Nevertheless, we can see here that the DPG agent is able to perform even better than the random actions and here is some sometimes um, near the or equal the optimal solution you and therefore we here use only one hidden layer and eight neurons <coughs> nevertheless it can be seen for example in here that there are also cases in where the agent loses track and the performance drops roughly. Um, that could be caused, for example, by a suboptimal set of hyperparameters, like, for example, wrong learning rate, um, so a wrong step size for our optimizer, which uh, yeah, could be indicated by first the down here and then the up again um, that we, yeah, jumped over valley or whatever um, <clears throat> in that learning curve and yeah could be also uh, emphasized by bad initial weight scaling for example and to figure that out what's happening here in detail um, on the one hand we could do an hyperparameter optimization. So, for example, uh, choose a different learning rates like using a grid or random search, um, or simply first check um, the actions um, the agent performs using random initialization to see uh, the influence of the random start point uh, to our training process. Yeah, for more. And for more details, we could even uh, track the losses of the actor and critic to see what's going on. And yeah, therefore, I would try to emphasize you to try it out if you're interested in um, why it's not always performing that good as we see in, for example, this run, which is yeah, quite good. Um, it should be mentioned that, as we see here, we face the problem that uh, that single runs could lead to really failure, and um, yeah, that could be dangerous depending on the application. And this is not always obvious. Um, if, for example, in the lecture books they always average or often average um, over a lot of episodes and uh, neglect your yeah, single failure behavior and yeah therefore safety and reinforcement learning is um, at the moment a key topic under development where you can yeah, achieve safer results for example as a hint here with a proper reward de design while taking a look at this uh, my guess initial um, initialization over there. Comparing now here the episode wise versus the stepwise um, training, it looks like the stepwise update work a little bit better. At least, yeah, they all learn something in the way we want in the end. Um, redoing the experiment already showed slightly different results and maybe you have different ones um, as well. So to understand uh, the behavior here better and especially the, the dropouts here and why episode or stepwise would be um, better, we should first investigate that um, yeah, trail, uh, failed trials here um, like just mentioned. Yeah, and um, next we can now execute here these cells to um, test 
our agent here first, the episode ones, and um, at least the stepwise ones, where we see the optimal control reaches a reward of 0 0.0122. And um, yeah, here, for example, in the episode case, um, we this one would be the best, and in the stepwise case, yeah, maybe this one here. And yeah, while executing that, we should in the end sometimes see our rocket flying. So I will start here, for example, the stepwise, and we see here all agents, all four point agents forming in our environment. Yeah, and um, in the end, let's have a look at the implementation using stable baselines as demo here, like mentioned before. And all you need for stable baselines executing the same because the DDPG is implemented there already are these few lines of code um, where we define here first our action noise um, and uh, next the network using that activation function and the policy or the, the actor network um, and the critic network out of eight neurons and one layer um, and here the DDPG agent with the hyperparameters and then we call the DPG agent is called model here, um, like in the examples of stable baselines. We call model.learn and um, tell him how many steps to learn. And yeah, that's it. Uh, pay, be, per default, uh, should be mentioned, he learns episode wise. Uh, you can change this using hyperparameter. Therefore, we refer to the documentation here. And additionally, we give here a callback. Which is just yeah that you can um, have this T T Q D M bar in here, and yeah here are the results from the stable baselines learning, and as you can see yeah um, the performance is somewhat similar to what we got here. We've got also these dropouts here, so. Um, yeah, you could think about that it's maybe a systematic problem because we've also used the same hyperparameters over here, the same reward functions, um, uh, same random initialization. So all what we've discussed above, we could figure, um, investigate in more detail. A um, more interesting part thing is that at least on yeah my machine here, stable baselines three took. Um, amount of more time uh, for the training than um, training the same steps using our written algorithm but yeah uh, in the end stable baselines has implemented a lot of more features we are currently maybe not using or which run under the hood so yeah um, if you're interested just play a little bit around with stable baselines take a look at it um, they've got a pretty good documentation and yeah therefore we refer to the user guide yeah okay yeah that's it for the first part you can of course also execute the stable baseline agent in the same manner and for the second part of the exercise where we will deal with the ppo um i will now hand over to my colleague wilhelm kirchgesner Hey, this is Wilhelm Kirchgesner, and I'm going to guide you through the second part of this exercise. In this part, we will deal with the same environment, but a different algorithm, specifically the Proximal Policy Optimization Algorithm, or short, PPO. This algorithm is characterized by being on policy. There will be no update, updates on experience that wasn't generated from the currently operating policy. And by clipping the probability ratio of chosen actions that scale the advantage function in order to mitigate erratic policy updates as expressed by this equation here. A noteworthy difference in implementation in contrast to that of the DDPG now is that of the rollout buffer, which has to be refilled every time we update the actor weights in order to meet the on-policy requirement. And we'll see that more in more detail later. 
So the first task is again to implement the algorithm given the code template. We keep it simple, do not incorporate vectorized environments, neither synchronously nor asynchronously. So in this case, we have a PPO agent class and inside the PPO agent class, we also have the rollout buffer class. The rollout buffer gets its, gets its own class declaration with a push and fetch method apart from the constructor. For push, we just simply add the different signals to the corresponding buffers, which are NumPy arrays in this context. For fetch, there is some more logic involved. In particular, the generalized advantage estimation is calculated given the buffers in such a way that we can resort to NumPy matrix algebra and avoid lengthy Python for loops. Having computed the advantages and rewards go, these arrays are returned together with relevant other data, other buffers. An alternative implementation could be to calculate the reward and the advantages on the go, but you could imagine that this would involve more Python logic and type inference and overall slower computation. Moving forward, in the agent constructor, we need to define at least the actor and critic as well as the PyTorch optimizers. For the VLOS, it is the simple mean squared error between the critic's estimates and the calculated rewards go, whereas the PyLOS implements the clipping logic we saw earlier. Interestingly, we implement the probability ratio as the difference between the log probabilities which can be considered more computationally stable. Now the deliberate function, it involves fetching data from the rollout buffer and applying the standard PyTorch weight update loops over a few epochs across both agents within the PPO algorithm. The decide function then is pretty straightforward and we've seen that in several prior exercises. Yet what is different for the PPO is the modeling of a probability distribution this time. So we introduce exploration during learning, not by some action noise, but rather by sampling from that learned distribution. And here it happens to be a univariate Gaussian. So in essence, we are learning two parameters that parameterize the distribution, a sigma and a mu. If you would like to see deterministic decisions, then we were simply to choose the mean value of the learned distribution rather than sampling from it. This is for the declarations in the class. Moving forward to the main loop. Uh, since the main loop is already given, there is actually nothing left for us to implement. Nothing left, nothing more to do than executing it and seeing what we get. Doing it four times. And here we have four evaluations now with different initializations. And we can see that there are pretty noisy updates, sometimes with a dip in between the learning curves, but all in all, pretty strong performances. What's interest, interesting here is first that the episode lengths linearly decrease on average, most of the time, of course, while the reward plateaus out early. So the agent learns not only to get a high altitude, but also to get there quicker and quicker. Second, the reward sporadically seems to exceed the optimal reward, which might be both pretty impressive and puzzling. If we repeat that experiment to a total of 50 times and plot the median rewards and the upper whole of all reward trajectories, we can get a even better picture of what is happening on average. So we see in green here the median reward, the median over all trajectories across each episode. And in blue, we see the, the best seen reward, the best achieved reward on each episode across all 50 trajectories. And in fact, the median reward as well as the best achieved reward tends to increase over the course of training episodes, which is good.
uh, but we also recognize that the best reward is significantly better than what the so-called optimal solution was supposed to be also sometimes even early on in training already so what is happening is AI, ai taking over <laughs> of course not there is something wrong with our optimal solution and the reason is subtle but simple our indication for what is optimal here is based on an analytical control solution that was derived from a continuous time system. Yet, this is a system we discreetly interact with here, with the decide and deliberate structure, such that optimal control decisions are rather applied for a certain time equal to the sampling period rather than continuously. This changes the environment, of course in which the control agent is acting in. So anyway, it is nice to see that our learning algorithm is able to see through this constraint and is even better than that control analytical control solution. But it is of course to be expected that if one is taking the discretization of the system into account, that the analytical optimal solution should be the upper, uh, upper boundary on that control task. Um, on the other hand, it is likely that we could also see even better performance with the reinforcement learning agent if we would let the agent train for more episodes than 250, since the trend is not plateauing out completely here. Same for optimized hyperparameters. So there's also room for improvement there. But it should be obvious by now that training function approximators always involves repeating the same experiment in order to marginalize the effect of random weight initial initializations out. If you were to train just a few times, like only those four times here, you might by chance get a very biased picture of your algorithm. So it might be that, for example, we could get very low, very low performances four times just by chance. Okay, and for the last part, we can see how this could be done with stable baselines. So this code is also already given. There is some callback function given already just to see a, a loading bar here for convenience. But all in all, there is much less code involved, of course. A lot is hidden uh, within the stable baselines package. But we can also see, if we do it four times, that uh, we get this dramatically less code with some lower performance, as this stable baselines modification, the stable baselines package has no modifications suited for this rocket environment, like fitting all episodes into the role of buffer and the likes. So only the first one looks kind of good, resembles what we have seen with the custom implementation. So take this as a demonstration on all that blindly using packages might not be the best. Thank you for watching. We hope you liked this exercise. If there are still questions, please don't hesitate to reach out or ask questions during the flipped classroom sessions. See ya.